take away. I didn't think I had an hour and a half this morning, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so this morning, um, what I'd like to do <clears throat> is continue our, our look into David's life and discover a few more things about what happened in his experience in the hope that we can find some help for our life take some things out of it that will be uh, of benefit to us. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. yep. Now, um, I realise that uh, this is my last week on, on David for now, so with your permission, I'd like to look at four different aspects of his life, four different areas, and four different readings. So who, um, I know um, Greg before alluded to this, but um, who's been watching the news about the American elections, any of the updates? Not, it's not something I really get uh, excited about. But I was interested in this. You know, when, when the change came from uh, President Biden stepping down and then uh, Kamala stepping up into that um, election position, the first thing that happened on the opposition side was all this bad press was given out. They had everything ready to launch an attack on her. And how did he do it? On her character. It's pretty sad, isn't it? That's the state of the world that we live in. And I guess what we need to do is understand that that's the environment that we move in, that's the experience that we're going to have to face. How do we respond to that? What is our character, uh, what is our character in the, in the face of that? how we develop our walk before people. So those are some of the things that have been on my mind, and um, I'd like to take a reading with you now. First of all, in 2 Samuel and uh, chapter 1, please. So if you've got your Bible handy, 2 Samuel chapter 1. D David has written something here. Daughters of Israel... Weep for Saul, verse 24, who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things, who decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Father, we just pray that as we read these verses and some others in uh, the minutes that are spared to us, that you will just lift them up and provide your blessing on them. That you would speak uh, through these words into our hearts this morning and help us to appreciate the things that you've recorded for us to be of help to us. We pray that everything that is done will be to your glory and your honour in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I've got um, four things that we're looking at here. The first one I've put under the heading of grieving, and then genuine, then guidance, and then grace. <clears throat> the last time I was here, if you were um, along that Sunday, we looked at the uh, situation that happened in Ziklag, and that's towards the end of David's um, escape from Saul. He's on the run. He's one of those that has been hunted down. And we saw that, you know, early on in his, in his life he was a shepherd, and we saw that the preparation stage of his life was so important to what was going to happen later on. And it doesn't matter at what point um, we come to God and get serious with Him. But the moment we make that decision, He will develop us and prepare us for what's ahead. And so the second part of um, David's life, he was in the palace and he was, he was serving Saul. So it wasn't long until he had to get out for his life and he was on the run. So Zitlach was at the end of that period, and right after the victory, where David was able to recover all that was lost, 
Then the news comes. The Philistines had attacked Israel and not only Saul had been killed, but Jonathan too. So this is a hugely, hugely important stage in Israel's history, but also in the life of David. You see, for years now, David had been promised that one day he would be king. He'd been anointed by the prophet. Samuel had come at the, at the uh, instructions of God and anointed him king. So he knew it was going to happen. But here it is. All those years had passed since the promise. And now suddenly he finds this situation unfolding. And what does he do? Well, surely, surely his enemies have been taken out of the way. The person that he'd been running from for all those years had been removed. You know, this is an exciting time. David's going to jump up and praise God and thank him and get into things and think, start planning, you know, getting the calendar out, working out the events that need to happen to celebrate his, his uh, right to the throne and all the promises that God had given to him. But that's not what we find. That's not what happened at all. David pauses. And this is the thing I want to um, talk with you about in terms of character. This is really showing us who David is. So God has been developing David since those early days of his, his promise to walk with him. He's been developing him. And all of those challenges he's faced, and they've been real tough challenges, have taken him to this point. And, and what's inside David, the work that God has done in his life, is now starting to come out. And so people are watching. And we'll, we'll pick up on this in a minute. But this is really, really important. That's what Plugged in now, I've got some juice. <laughs> Look out. Now, so, so what's happening now is something that is revealing <clears throat> David's character. And the people are watching. And so, David begins by penning a song. Nothing too unusual about that. David's good at it. You know, he's got great experience. People loved uh, singing David's songs. But the words that he puts in are quite remarkable. He said, weep for Saul. Weep for Saul. This is David's enemy, and he's asking the nation to share in grief for the one that was lost. Isn't that remarkable? Could, could we do that? Could we, could we do that if somebody was so opposed to us and caused us so many years of pain? Could we ask others to join in remembering the good things about them? Is that, is that something that's possible? Is it in our hearts to do that? It's, that's a real challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's all right to think about it here and now, but when we're in the middle of it, what's coming out? What's coming out? What's in our hearts? Have we got the ability, like David did, to see things as God sees them, however tough that is? He brings a tribute. And so what David is doing, he's lifting up the good things that Saul did. Now, there was plenty of the bad stuff, heaps of things that he did wrong. But David doesn't say that. He could have done, would have been legitimate, but he doesn't say that. He's just lifting up the good things. Now, that takes some, that takes some respect, doesn't it? That's real character coming out there, just talking about the good things. And now remember that all this is happening. David, David is, is not emotionally removed from that situation. And I want to make that point because it's not that David is able to do this just to satisfy the situation, make people think that he's, you know, he's, 
he's okay with everything that's happening and he's respectful and all that. This is a time of huge emotional trauma for David. And he, he mentions it there in those verses. Jonathan, the one I love, he also died. He had lost a true companion of his heart. Someone that had faithfully walked beside him when everything else was against him. David was in the middle of grieving for his close friend. And still, his true character comes out. He's only going to speak of the good things. You know, I think it's important. It's important just while we're here to look at that because I think as Christians, often we tend to just brush past this stuff and, and pretend we're all good and, and we can cope with it because God's in control and he is and that's great, praise him and, and you know we've got to be seen to be, to be strong and able to cope with it all but actually what I find is that even Jesus responded to the grief of the situation we know what happened with Lazarus don't we surest verse in the Bible is Thank you. Jesus wept. He, he, he could see the future and all that was going to happen afterwards. But in that moment, he recognized the grief and the loss. And he saw the situation and he responded as we can respond. True heartfelt grief came out. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, when it talks about death, and it talks about it in the, in the setting of victory. So as Christians, we've got this amazing hope. We've got something to look forward to, and it's wonderful. And sometimes we take that verse where it says, death, where is your sting? And we, and we pull it out of context. You know, we say, you know, there's, there's no issue with death. Death, um, it's, it's not a problem for us Christians. Actually, the sorrow and the grief around it is very, very real. Because when it says, death, where is your sting? It's talking about the time when Jesus will come again and give us our new resurrection bodies. At that moment, what Christ did at Calvary will be seen in the light of day. And the victory that he has secured will be evident to everyone. And then it says, there will be no tears. There will be no more tears. Praise him. But here, we have to allow that process of grief while we lose those that we love to journey with. And so this is where the true character comes out. So David was able to share that experience and help the people as they were mourning the loss of someone they held dear. You know, it's, it's another thing <clears throat> I want to just mention briefly. Where it says um, just about Saul being David's enemy. You know, there's, there's times where we are confronted by others that have got it in for us. Now, I don't know, you may be going through a situation at the moment. It could be in a, a social setting or it could be perhaps in a work situation where things are a challenge. And for no fault of your own, you're facing persecution and people are really treating you badly. Now, what do we do as Christians? What do we do as Christians? Do we just roll over and take it all? Well, I don't think that's what's intended. But how do we respond to those situations? 
Do we go in and try and undermine the person that's attacking us? Find fault with them? Talk to others about them? It's a real challenge because the Bible is clear. Proverbs 24, 17 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and don't let your heart be glad when they stumble. And Jesus, of course, said in Matthew 5, Pray for your enemies. And so there's this real balance, isn't there? And David exampled it here. Being respectful, allowing your conduct to be above rebuke, and not celebrating the downfall of those that are opposed to you. But if anything, pray for them. And that's really tough. Because their, their attack on you could be relentless. But we've still got to pray for them. Now, here's something that's really, really important. I want to read to you some verses in Romans 12. <clears throat> First of all, verse 14, and then 17 to 19. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And dropping down, it says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Good? Happy with that? Yes. And so often we leave it there. But then notice this. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. You see, sometimes you can be doing the right thing and still not have peace because people are out to get you. And they will make it their life's mission to bring you down. And sometimes, sometimes, we have to have distance between us and others if we're able to create some distance because the work of bringing revenge is God's. That's what Romans 12 says. That's God's business. That's not ours. But it's not wise to be in their presence. We need to pull back. If we can't get peace with that person, to pull back and allow God to deal with the situation. Not try and get in there and give them what they deserve. That's not Christian. So it's interesting, isn't it? And Jesus himself said, Father, forgive them. Where did he say that? At the cross. At the cross. His greatest scene of opposition. And he says, Father, forgive them. Wow, what a lesson. We must, must move on. The next... Um, the second verse that I want to look at is in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel. And I'm going to jump in quickly at verse 31. It says, David then ordered Joab and all the people that were with him, tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn over Abner. King David walked behind the coffin. When they buried Abner in Hebron, the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept. And the king sang a lament for Abner. Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not placed in bronze shackles. You fell like one who falls victim to criminals. And all the people wept even more. Then they came to urge David to eat food while it was still day. But David took an oath, may God punish me. And do so severely if I taste bread or anything before sunset. All the people took note of this, and it pleased them. In fact, everything the king did pleased them. On that day, all the troops and all Israel were convinced that the king had no part in the killing of Abner, son of Ner. Who is Abner? Why is he important? Abner was 
the military commander of the ten tribes of Israel that broke away, as we've been hearing this morning, from um, Judah and Benjamin. So, majority of Israel, essentially. Now, he was there when Saul was in control. And when Saul died, he took the kingdom and uh, basically um, had military control over it in that short term. He was a hugely influential and powerful figure in Israel. And he was keeping the kingdom split and away from David. Now, what does David do? He had every right to stamp his foot and say, this is mine, God's promised it, you need to come down here and bow before me and accept that I'm king and I'm going to rule over all Israel. Well, he could have done that. He could have taken it by force. But that probably would have ended in years of civil unrest and rebellion. But what David does is very, very interesting. He basically sets a table for Abner and invites him in a place of peace and discusses with him what can happen. Now, he lets Abner go. He doesn't harm him. He just lets him go again. And on the basis of that, Abner was actually going to bring the kingdom to David. Remarkable. But see, Joab, who was the ruler of David's forces, second in command, he didn't like it. He, he basically turned around and said, David, you're a weak man. You've done the wrong thing. You're not good enough for this situation. I'm going to handle it. And he goes out and he pursues Abner. And in a moment of anger, he takes his life. Abner was not expecting it because he'd left in peace. You see, this is the way the world works. You know, take, take a situation that has been handled carefully and with wisdom and turn it on its head. And now David's got a massive problem. What does he do? Everybody will think, well, Joab works for David, and so David must have done this, and so David's just underhand tactics have caused this situation, and now the whole kingdom's going to be blown apart. You see what's happened? You see, it doesn't matter sometimes how careful we are, the enemy will still attack. It comes in different forms. And so we've got to be careful about that. So how, how do we respond when that happens. Well, this is what David did. First of all, it says, he put on sackcloth, which was a sign of respect and mourning, and he really just humbled himself before the people. Not just that, he tore his clothes, and then he told all of his leaders to do the same thing, which was a real sign of respect and humility, and then they put ashes on. So, it, what I'm seeing here is that he's not just saying the right things. He is demonstrating the right things. He is doing something that is evident to everybody who's watching. Really, really important. When it comes time to pay respects for Abner, David will walk, not ride on a, a horse or in a chariot or anything else. He will walk behind that funeral procession. Another mark of respect. He will, he will declare his thoughts about Abner and what happened, and the people are watching. But they're not convinced yet. They've, they're taking it all in. Have you noticed that? People are watching the whole time, just taking these sins in, just watching, watching, watching. Let your light shine before people. Is that what Jesus says? Let your light shine. When you're living God's way, your light will be on and people will be watching it. And they're watching. And now they come. Towards the end of the day, it's been a long day, and they say, David, you've got to eat something. And he said, I will not eat. This day is not about me. It's about respecting 
the persons who was, whose life was taken in a moment of evil. This day is about Abner. And his, his attitude was evident to all. And then it says the people knew that David had nothing to do with what happened to Abner. Isn't that interesting? And so our behavior is on display the whole time. You might not think about it too much. You might think people are, you know, they tease me about being a Christian. They criticize me and so on. But actually, what does it matter, you know? What, do you, what does it matter how, how good they think I am? They're watching everything. And they'll pick up on the smallest thing they think you do wrong. And so it's important to let our light shine. And then if, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 13, it says, The service is a proof of your faith, and people will praise God be because of it. So the things that we do, people will see, and as a result of them, they're pleasing God, the people will recognize it. And God will get the glory for it. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 2, 12, People who don't believe might say you're doing wrong, but live good lives among them. Why? They will see your good deeds and they will give glory to God. So we don't try and put on a show, but living closely to God, our light will be on and we're on display and God gets the glory. That's what happened here. Isn't it amazing? Let's move on. Is that clicked on? Guidance. I'm going to read very quickly now in the fifth chapter, 2 Samuel 5, verse 1. All the tribes of Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, Here we are, your own flesh and blood. Even when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led us out to battle and brought us back. The Lord also said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be ruler over Israel. Verse 17, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they all went in search of David, but he heard about it went down to the stronghold. So the Philistines came and spread out in the valley, in Rephaim Valley. Then David inquired of the Lord, Should I attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, Attack, for I will certainly hand the Philistines over to you. Then verse 22, the Philistines came up again and spread out in the valley Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, do not attack directly, but circle round behind them and come at them opposite the Bassam tree. When you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the trees, act decisively, for the Lord would have gone out ahead of you to strike down the army of the Philistines. So David did exactly as the Lord had commanded him to do. All these things are, are big events at the start, at the establishment of David's kingdom. And it's interesting, isn't it, that there's never a dull, dull moment for him. No sooner has he, he you know, laid Saul and lamented Saul, laid him to rest, and then dealt with the issue with Abner, and then the enemy is on the doorstep. Here's what's interesting. You see, David was a skilled warrior. He had had years of uh, success in dealing with the enemy and destroying them. That wasn't an issue for him. So why didn't David just think to himself, well... I've got the kingdom, this is, this is the way God has set it up, there's a challenge coming, I know how to handle this, let's get in, sort it out, and then the problem will be dealt with. Do we make that mistake? Do we make that mistake? I'm sure, 
I'm sure if we're honest, I, you know, I've made that mistake. You rely on your own ability. And sometimes when you have success at something, you think, yep, I know how to do that. So you, you do it again. Things change, you see. And this is why it's so, so important to notice what David did. He spread it out before God. He didn't rely on his own ability, as good as it was, and successful as it had been. He said, Lord, here's the situation. What do you want me to do here? That's good, eh? You see, the time had come for him to take the throne of Israel. That was a moment of huge pressure. He was vulnerable to the attack of the enemy because, and here's one of the things I want to look at in a minute with you, pride can lift somebody up. You know, God's given him everything. He's fulfilled his promises. It's a moment where David could think, yep, I've made it now. I'm in the place where God wants me. It's all good. And on the basis of that, he might have made a bad decision. But he doesn't. Because what's in his heart is coming out. And he spreads it out before God and he says, what do you want? How, how do you want me to respond to this attack? That's good, eh? So uh, the Lord says to David, go out. You will defeat them. So he did. Went out. What happens? Not long later, they come back again. Really? You find that? You deal with one thing, you get another. It's like those um, whack-a-mole things. You, you pop one, and then another one comes up. And it's constant, isn't it? The attacks of the enemy don't let us rest. And so David has got the, the, the same valley, the same enemy, same place, same situation. Okay, I know what God told me to do. I'll go ahead and do it. You see? No. Because David has learned... I can't rely on my own strength. Yes, I, I got this answer last time, but here it is again. What do I do, Lord? Good job he asked. Because God said, no, I've got something different in mind this time. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to start the attack, and you can finish it off behind. And that time, after they'd been defeated, they left him alone. A good stint. Hey, that's good, isn't it? You see, it wouldn't have happened if David went in his own strength. But here he is relying on God and asking God what to do in the situation. Here's some things, here's some things that often trip us up. Now, Peter talks about um, the enemy as a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. There are times in our, in our walk, in our journey, when we're more prone um, to his attacks and responding badly. And these, you may find these helpful. I have. Pride is one. We've just talked about that. Pride. That can come in and cause issues. Another one is hunger. Hunger can cause us to make bad decisions. When somebody's hungry, we can do something that is not helpful for us. Remember how Elijah had, had that tremendous success with Baal and the prophets of Baal? And then he was on the run. And God woke him from asleep and he said, eat. He did it a second time. He said, you need to eat so that you've got strength for the journey. And sometimes, and, we, and just these are general things that we can be conscious of. Because if we're, if we're just walking through life unaware of these things, they can catch us out. Sometimes, without noticing it, we can be hungry. And as a result of being hungry, we're not performing the best we can. We're not focused on God. We're not relying on God and we make bad decisions. See, God understands that. So we, he's reminding us again, we need things to function physically 
so that the Spirit of God can work effectively through us. God, God can work His work regardless of us. But let's not be unwise. Let's not be unwise. So watch for pride, watch for hunger, loneliness. Paul writes to Timothy, and it's interesting how he helps Timothy. And he encourages Timothy in the things that he's doing, and he is warning him about things to avoid. Timothy had a true friend helping him on the spiritual journey. So loneliness is another area of weakness. Anger. Remember how Moses struck the rock. God said, just speak to the rock. And Moses hit it because he was angry with the people. Watch out for anger. <coughs> anger can cause us to stumble and fall. The enemy knows this. And then being tired. Well, the Lord Jesus knows all about tiredness. He was found asleep on the boat. But he also said to the disciples, come aside and rest a while with me. Because they were constantly being pressured by all the people that had needs. So tiredness is another area of vulnerability. And so God would have us be wise about these things, be aware of them, conscious of them, praying against the enemy's attack in these areas so that we can make decisions that God is pleased with. Right. Lastly, grace. I just want to, I can't finish David without noticing this. In 2 Samuel 9, 2 Samuel 9, David asks, is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Verse 8, Mephibosheth paid homage and said, what is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Isn't it amazing? Now, for the sake of time, we're just going to call him M. <laughs> That's good. I wonder where the uh, James Bond franchise got it from. Anyway, here is somebody who didn't have a great experience in life. Jonathan's son. And, and it was no thought of his own, but he was dropped as a young child by his nurse and was lame in both legs. So he had no, nothing really going for him. In those days, it would have been tremendously hard. We, don't, we have so much support today around our society in those areas, but for him, it meant no work. No prospects. It was really a terrible situation to be in. What I'm interested in here is that David had this promise that he'd made to Jonathan all those years before. And now that things had settled, and he found himself in a place that he was able to look at some of these things in his life, he said, is there anyone of Jonathan's family still here? And it didn't matter to David what condition M was in. He was going to make provision for him. Can you imagine being Mephibosheth, coming into David's presence? A lame man with no prospects, nothing to his name, coming into the palace and seeing all the, the splendor and the gold and the glory and the glitz of it all. And here's the king in his robes. And you walk, but well, you can't walk. You're being helped up in front of him. Who am I, says David? Who am I, said M, sorry. Who am I that I can be here? David says. David says, you will sit at my table. At my table. Doesn't this speak to us? of the grace of God. You see, all those years before, in 1 Samuel 17, when David went out to battle, there was a picture there of Jesus going against Goliath. And in that moment, he defeated the enemy and destroyed the one who had power over death. 
and delivered us who all our lifetime have been subject to fear through fear of death. That's Hebrews 12, isn't it? Jesus had destroyed the enemy and dealt with sin. But here it is. Not content with just dealing with the enemy and satisfying God and all his claims against sin, he wants to bring us in and seat us at his table. Wow. Not just any table. At the table that he sits at every day of our life. Think about that. The glory, the provisions, the splendor, the grace of God to provide for us. Song of Solomon says, you have set me at your table and your banner over me is love. Isn't that awesome? That's the heart of God to us. This is what David is exampling here. This is the blessing of God. Ephesians 6, all the things that we have in Christ are ours because of Calvary. Everything's here for us to enjoy. What's our decision? What's our decision? Have we accepted Jesus as our Savior? Have, have we accepted that in us there's no good thing that could ever please God, but we need forgiveness? Have we accepted that God sent Jesus to take our place, to take the punishment for my sin? So what do I do? Well, all I have to do and all I can do is say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I've done wrong against God. I can't make amends for that, but I accept that you have. Please come into my heart and make me yours. And he'll do that today, right now. If you haven't made that decision, please make it today. And you can sit at his table and enjoy all the goodness and the and the beautiful provision that he has for you. Life is going to be tough. We've seen that in David's experience. Life has its challenges. But you will no longer walk alone. You will walk with him. And the victory belongs to him. Guard against the things. Guard against the things that come against us. All the enemy's attacks. Seek the guidance of God. Be humble before him. And he will be the blessing in your life that helps you through all the challenges and difficulties that you face. Let's give thanks to him. Father, thank you again for the wonderful Lord Jesus who came to this scene to save us from our sins. Father, we remember how he, he was familiar with sorrow and grief. Father, we remember how he was genuine in his actions. People tried to trip him and, and cause him to stumble, sent people to ask questions of him to trip him up, and, and yet they came back and said, we have never heard anyone speak like this man. He is full of grace and truth. He is of genuine character. He is without fault. He is sinless. He is perfect. Father, we remember that he, even, even being your son, could bow his knee and said, Father, not my will, but yours. Help us, help us to do that too, Lord. And Father, we thank you that you have provided a place at your table. Encourage us and fill us with your joy 
as we guide into this week, with all the challenges that lay ahead, to remember you are a good and a faithful God who will always walk with us and defend us and help us. We bless you in Jesus' name.